In this episode of Scaling Postgres, we talk about Postgres 16 Beta 2, the rise of vectors, foreign data wrapper performance, and unused indexes. I'm Creston Jamieson, and this is Scaling Postgres, episode 272. All right, I hope you, your friends, family, and coworkers continue to do well. Our first piece of content is PostgreSQL 16 Beta 2 released. This is from PostgreSQL.org, and Beta 2's been released. Not too many changes, but the one that caught my eye was the default collation provider selected by initdb has changed back to libc, so clearly some issues with defining collations when starting out. But if you want to see all the new stuff in Postgres 16, you can try out this Beta 2. Next piece of content, vectors are the new JSON in PostgreSQL. This is from jcats05.com. And when I first looked at this title, I interpreted it as replacing JSON, and I thought, oh no. But actually, that's not the case. What Jonathan is describing is that vectors are in the place where JSON was a number of years back, meaning that back prior to Postgres 9.2, there was no JSON support in Postgres, but with 9.2, they introduced a text version of the format. And in terms of indexes, you had to rely on expression indexes if you wanted to query from it. But then a short time later in version 9.4, they added the JSON B type, which is the binary storage representation. And they added gen indexes to allow you to query it at a high performance level. So he says vectors are pretty much in the same place. So for years, Postgres has supported arrays and you can store vectors in those arrays. And additionally, there's the cube data type, and that can store vectors as well. But each of them has their little caveats. So for example, he says, quote, arrays can handle vector dimensionality, like up to a thousand different dimensions, but not different types of operations you want to do, like a nearest neighbor. Cubes can handle those types of operation nearest neighbors, but they can't handle the thousands of dimensionality that exist for artificial intelligence or machine learning requirements. But there's this relatively new extension called pgvector that satisfies this condition. In addition, it has an index called an IVF flat to do indexing of those vectors. So he envisions this at about the stage of where JSON was introduced and that now we're just looking at how we want to refine it and what features should be placed in the Postgres core what enhancements should be added to the PG vector extension that's been created. So I found this very interesting. There's also the presentation that he did, Vectors Are the New JSON, that I would encourage you to check out as well. In addition, there's another piece of content, Storing and Querying Vector Data in Postgres with PG Vector. This is on pganalyze.com, and this is Lucas's Five Minutes of Postgres, and this is the blog post he covers in this. He goes into more depth on the subject, as well as gives a lot of kudos to Andrew Kane, who actually was the lead developer on PG Vector, which is interesting because he actually has written a lot of Ruby libraries as well. So he's been very prolific in the Ruby community as well. So kudos to him. And I definitely encourage you to check out Lucas's piece of content with regard to this. Next piece of content also related to PG Vector is image recognition with Python, OpenCV, OpenAI, Clip, and PG Vector. This is from Dev2 in the Francisco Tizio section. Now, he's talking about the PG Vector extension being added as support to the Avian database, which is a variant of Postgres. But what I found interesting about this post is covering vectors from first principles. So it gives an introduction to vectors and embeddings to help understand what they're all about. So if you're interested in learning more about that, definitely encourage you to check out this blog post as well. Next piece of content, performance tips for Postgres foreign data wrappers. This is from crunchydata.com. And as you use foreign data wrappers, this one, they're predominantly talking about the Postgres foreign data wrapper. So you're speaking to another server and pulling the data from it and potentially combining it with data that exists on your local database. And they mention performance can be pretty good until you start trying to join across multiple servers. So you're joining a local table with a remote table, therein lies some issues. Because if you do a simple join like this to a foreign table, what the foreign database sees is actually just a select all from the remote table, and they fetch it 100 rows at a time. So basically, this results in a very inefficient query. 
Now they say here that local joins are going to perform fine. That just works as expected. Remote joins, that's where you're querying a remote server and you're asking to join tables on that remote server. That happens fine as long as you're on at least version Postgres 11. But it's these cross server joins that you run into issues. And the first recommendation for handling this is using a CTE. So basically you define in the CTE how you want to query that remote table so it doesn't bring back all the data, just precisely the data that you need, and then join it to the local table. You can also use subqueries to do some of the querying as well, but they did say in the CTE here where you're looking for certain number of IDs that you don't want to use N, you want to use any to try and materialize the local table's IDs before sending them over. That allows a much more efficient query to be sent to the remote server and get the data back that you want. Another recommendation is increasing the fetch count. So as opposed to just by default 100 rows, there may be cases depending on the query. Maybe you want to fetch 1,000 rows at a time, 10,000 rows at a time. So they have a recommendation with regard to that. And then also, once you get to really large data sizes, consider caching locally. This could be done through a materialized view or even just creating a cache table that is maintained using a merge command. So you merge new changes into that local table. And I kind of like what he says here, quote, for farm data wrapper performance, think like an application developer. So you really need to think, how am I going to construct this query together to make it the most efficient it can be? So normally you just query the data that you want to and Postgres is able to figure out the most optimized path to give it to you. But when you're crossing a server to server boundary, you need to take more responsibility for thinking about how to query the data in an efficient manner. But if you want to learn more, definitely check out this blog post. Next piece of content, finding unused indexes in PostgreSQL. This is from pg-.io. And of course, the more indexes you add, the more you can boost select performance, but at the expense of inserts and updates. So as an example here, they created a table and then added three indexes to it. And then this other table, they had no indexes. And then you can see that inserting a million rows took four times as long with three indexes on it compared to no indexes. In addition, with an update, updating that million rows took four times as long with three indexes versus having no indexes. So having additional indexes will definitely have a performance impact from a insert and update perspective, even though maybe your selects are faster. So definitely something to keep in mind. And then of course, the last thing mentioned is that it's also gonna take up more disk space. The more indexes you have, the more disk space you have. But how do you identify indexes that can be removed? And for that, you generally use the pgstat user indexes view because that tells you how many index scans have happened for each index. Now a disadvantage of this it shows an aggregate count. So if it's been a while since your statistics have been reset, it can be hard to determine if recent indexes are not being used anymore. It'll definitely tell you if indexes are never used, so this view is advantageous from that perspective. And they have a recommendation of actually storing the data on a periodic basis, so you can see those changes. But the benefit with Postgres 16 that they mention here is that they've added an additional column, last index scan. So it actually gives you the date at the last index scan occurred. So that way you can easily see the last time an index was used. So that's great. But if you want to learn more about that, you can definitely check out this blog post. Next piece of content, memory context, private memory management in PostgreSQL. This is from cyber.postgresql.com. And they're talking about usually running queries have their own memory area and, and they describe memory contexts. And this post goes into a lot of detail of the advantages how they're organized. And I definitely recommend reading this to get a good perspective on that. But there is a way to view memory context usage with this view, which is PG backend memory contexts, which it shows all memory contexts held by the current session. So for each session or connection to the database, you can examine the memory contexts. And there's also a function called PG log backend memory contexts, and you pass it in the process ID of the backend process. So basically you can find the process ID and pgstat activity of say a long running query, and then you can use that to see how the memory is being used. They talk about plugging up a debugger, which I wouldn't necessarily do in production, but then they go into issues of actually running out of memory in Postgres. And another way that information gets logged is that if you have appropriately set in Linux, 
the VM overcommit memory to two and tune your VM overcommit ratio. If Postgres runs out of memory, you'll get a regular run out of memory error as opposed to potentially crashing. And quote, Postgres will write a memory context dump to the log file. So you can actually look in the log file to see those memory contexts as well. So if you want to learn more about the subject, definitely recommend checking out this blog post. Next piece of content, pgconf DE 2023, the last hurrah of don't do this. This is from virus.org. And I believe we've covered this presentation before, but it's been updated for this month. And the presentation is don't do this. So the number of things that you should not do in Postgres and the actual PDF of all the slides are here. So this is something I think is good to review periodically to make sure you're not doing these things. So definitely recommend checking this piece of content out. Next piece of content, a look at PostgreSQL's journey over five years in Stack Overflow's developer survey. This is from stormatics.tech. And they've kind of pulled together some different surveys to show how Postgres has evolved over the last number of years. You can see the gold line here is PostgreSQL that's been increasing pretty steadily. It's kind of stabilized here, whereas a lot of the bigger players, the Oracle, MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server seem to have been declining, and more recently, MongoDB going down more than more than usual. This is from DB Engine's ranking, but they also show the most popular, and we covered this on last week's Scaling Postgres, where Postgres has now eclipsed MySQL being the most popular, and as well being the uh, most admired slash loved. So if you want to take a look at these charts, you can check out this blog post. Next piece of content, the do's, don'ts of Postgres high availability, part three, tools, rules. This is from enterprisedb.com, and they're talking about different tools you can use for your high availability setup. They have a number of recommendations here. One is EDB failover manager, a rep manager, and it considers these more traditional or a little bit older systems for doing high availability. Although they're also, I believe, products of EDB. Next they cover is Patroni. So this is one I've heard that's used a lot, as well as PG Auto Failover, which is, might be the simplest solution for doing high availability. And then lastly, their newest product by EDB, the Postgres Distributed. And in terms of backup tools, they recommend Barman. Again, that's a product of EDB, as well as PG Backrest as their recommended backup tools. So check out this blog post if you want to learn more. Next piece of content, using iCalendar R rule in Postgres. This is from aclaver.org. And I thought this was interesting because there's actually a defined rule called R rule that the iCalendar spec uses for determining repeating events. And he talks about the rule and shows you some Python libraries where you can pass in that rule's parameters to be able to display data. So in general, you wouldn't want to display all this individual data. You would only want to use it at render time, but actually just store the rule. And he shows how you would generally store that rule in Postgres. So here you could see he's defined a task title, a task description, the actual rule that's defined here, and then the start date. And then from this, you can generate all the repeating events. You don't have to store absolutely everything. And then he even wrote a PL Python function to find the next occurrence of an event based upon a rule. So if you're interested in that, definitely check out this blog post. Next piece of content, set up PostgreSQL development environment on Mac OS. This is from hygo.ca. So if you have interest in do doing that, you can check out this blog post. Next piece of content, Orioli DB beta has been released. This is from oriolidata.com. And this is the new storage engine that they developed that has taken a first principles approach, trying to maximize, they say here, high transaction throughput, high volume of updates, high volume of in-memory operations, and avoiding lock bottlenecks. And I think of this as basically a Z heap alternative where they're using an undo log as opposed to storing updates as a new row in the actual heap table. So this is great that the beta has been released. Check this blog post out if you want to learn more. Next piece of content, there was another episode of Postgres FM last week. This one was on UUID, and particularly discussing the performance aspects of UUIDs as primary keys. So you can listen to the episode here, or you can watch the YouTube video here. And the last piece of content, the Postgres School Person of the Week is Stephanie Janine Stolting. If you want to learn more about Stephanie and her contributions to Postgres, definitely check out this blog post. That does it for this episode of Scaling Postgres. You can get links to all the content mentioned in the show notes. Be sure to head over to scalingpostgres.com where you can sign up to receive weekly notifications of each episode, or you can subscribe via YouTube or iTunes. Thanks.